and welcome to another version of the Antique Trader and we're here with Ellen Hernandez from the San Antonio Quilt Guild Quilt Guild and we're taping out of Northwest Military in San Antonio welcome Ellen to the program and I'm so happy to have you here could you tell us a little bit about your background um, yes, um, I'm a retired nurse. Um, I moved to this area. My husband was active duty military, so we traveled uh, around the country and the world and um, have retired here and taking care of my granddaughter and being involved in all types of community activities and quilting is one of those. So tell us, what brought us to quilting? How did you start quilting? Well, my grandmother and her sisters and her mother were quilters. The, they were from Tennessee and lived in Florida. Um, as I was growing up, I never really quilted with my grandmother, but we started making something called patchwork. We put uh, different fabrics together and we made aprons. She had kind of a traditional patchwork pattern that she always wore an apron, and that's what we made together. And uh, from that, I. I would say I was uh, learned to sew in, um, back then it was in junior high. Uh, we took home ec classes and so I was very much interested in sewing and later on made, uh, just decided to make a quilt for a friend who was having a baby and that was my first quilt probably in the early 70s. So could you tell us, you told me that you knew a little bit about the history of quilting. Could yes. you tell us about that a little bit? Yes, um, I guess it'd be good to start with some of the vocabulary because quilters seem to have words that we use uh, and sometimes they're interchangeably misunderstood. Um, so patchwork is putting pieces of fabric together. So you have maybe a large piece, you cut it uh, into smaller squares, rectangles or triangles and then you combine colors and put them back together and have a large end result often a bed quilt. A quilt is actually a fabric sandwich. It has a backing, uh, a middle which is uh, could be cotton or wool uh, and a filler and then a top which is usually the more dramatic colorful part and those are then stitched together in a stitch called quilting. Um, some people think that um, having this patchwork of uh, colors and fabrics started maybe at the Civil War or uh, during the Depression when times were hard, but there's actually evidence that it probably started over 5,000 years ago. We know that other countries have artifacts um, that give us information. Uh, in When the tombs were discovered in Egypt, they found a cloak, uh, a ca an ivory carved cloak, and it was the shape of diamonds, and they felt that was a quilted pattern. There were also um, uh, in uh, other tombs they discovered pieces of patchwork that were used either on floor coverings and in China they were used as um, kind of like um, curtains or altar cloths. Um, so we know that um, many countries around the world were doing different textile and handwork activities. Um, you can see it from everywhere from Japan they have something called sashiko, which is um, traditionally kind of an indigo blue with um, pretty stitches on top. And that may have come from when the shoguns were limiting imported fabrics and cottons. Now you told me something else. You told me that you teach a class. Mm -hmm. What do you teach in your class when you teach about quilting? Um, well, I, I give presentations on quilt history. Um, so that I, I kind of do an overview of what's this history that we know of the past, the, some of the artifacts and from museums. Um, so I cover that and then some stories. Quilt stories are really um, something that I enjoy about um, every quilt has a story. We may have the quilt and have a story or maybe we have the story and not the quilt. And How do you associate the story with the quilt? How does the quilt tell a story? Well, uh, many ways. Uh, you could first start with the fabrics. So you can do a lot of, um, find out a lot of information from books, um, online. Um, people are discovering um, 
clues, we call it clues in the calico, you could say, of the uh, actual fabrics we can determine maybe when they were manufactured or a range of time when they were manufactured. So that helps you to date a quilt. So for example, this one, how yes. would we date that? Yes, you would look at the um, the weave of the fabric, which is kind of loose. You would look at some of the uh, prints that were very small and unusual, and you would put that probably in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, could this be feed sack. This particular one here? Yes, feed sack material. And how about that This one, one would be around the 40s, and there was a color change. So uh, right around uh, the Victorian era, they were very dark. Uh, there were browns and blacks uh, and what they called shirtings, very small prints. And you see this is nothing like that. This is bright pastels. And so that would be the 40s. This is out of the depression area. Um, people are happy. Yeah, because it looks yeah. a little bit more modern, yes. even the, the shapes. Right. And how about this one over here? That would be about the same time as this one. Um, that's uh, something, uh, another vocabulary word would be applique. So besides patchwork of putting pieces of fabric together, this is putting one fabric on top of another and stitching it down. But this seems to have an awful lot of stitches. This is all done by hand or machine? Yes, these are all done by hand. The sewing machine was actually, the first prototype was around um, the 1700s. But the more modern type that we know about today was came about in the 1840s. Um, by Elias Howe. Most people think it's um, Isaac Singer, but Singer actually stole um, Howe's um, patents and became more popular because he had a time payment plan and so people could afford the machines. But um, we do know that there are some early quilts from the 1800s that were machine quilted on these old sewing machines, but predominantly people were doing handwork. I'm curious, this is all hand work? Yes, and um, some quilts are called whole Oof. quilts, so there would be no color on it. It might be solid white, was traditional, and it was just to emphasize the quilting stitch. So all those intricate stitches, there might be feathers and cables and um, there could be animals, all different things just seen because of the stitch that they put in the it. The way I look at this, I look at them as little bumps on the road. <laughs> <laughs> and this is this is all all hand stitch. Yes. Every leaf, everything. Yes. How long would something like this take to finish? That's a difficult question uh, and people often ask that when we have classes and I have taught some quilting classes. I want this finished in two weeks or you know there's a timeline. Not happening. Um, it's, it's difficult to say. It depends on so many things. From your experience? Yes. That, okay. that would have to take at least, I would say, four months. Um, four months? Yeah. It, That's fast. It is. Um, it, I would think if, it would if you're take a busy uh, 1940s farm uh, woman, it would, could take six months or more. And you might have to have friends come in and help you. So it, it, there, it really depends on the intricate design. There was a, um, a famous. Uh, quilt contest in the 1933s uh, era um, and there was a short timeline. It was announced by Sears that they were at the Chicago World's Fair. They would accept quilts and within a about four month period over 25,000 quilts were entered. Now whether they were all done in that four month period or they might have been started at an earlier time but many it was called the century of progress and so many of the quilts looked very futuristic and modern with space and um, different things. So they were probably done in a short period. So how has the quilt made a comeback? How yes. did you notice that it's made a comeback and when? Yes, well, the um, handmade um, bed quilts probably faded out in the, at, after the 40s, in the 50s, because people were more prosperous, they could afford purchased blankets. A uh, blanket is not like a quilt, it doesn't have three layers, it's not stitched together in three layers. But it was fast, it was easy, and you're done. And um, you felt better because it might be more beautiful than you think you can make a quilt. So it really faded away and didn't come back until around the time that we were thinking of the bicentennial in um, 1970s. And that was kind of a folk art period 
where all the home folk crafts were so popular. And um, there really weren't magazines available to, you know, go out and say, I want to start making a quilt. How do I start? Um, it, w it was kind of like uh, grassroots again. Uh, there was one magazine that uh, was started, uh, the Quilter's Newsletter. It was in black and white. It was only a few pages. Um, it's grown into a, a major magazine publication now. Um, so people just started kind of by um, friends showing each other, maybe going back to grandparents or mothers that had done um, this type of art craft. So how much quilting do you think is done at the present time? An enormous amount. It's estimated there are over two and a half million quilters around the world. It's a multi-billion dollar business. Um, there's just no limit to quilting now. Um, is there regular fabrics where they manufacture quilts like these or they're all handmade? Um, mom, mom and pop business type of thing. Yes. Well, there was some controversy when um, the Smithsonian um, vintage uh, patterns ended up in China and quilts were being made in probably not as great quality fabric and um, uh, traditional quilters were very concerned that that happened, that they were being outsourced. And so th that kind of helped spur the interest in making quilts ourselves. So uh, women are, are taking lessons, for instance, if you go on the computer or you go to any major city, there are quilt guilds and classes that are offered. There are teachers around the world. Uh, Australia has a really large quilting community. So there's opportunities to learn new techniques and even the old techniques. Now I've seen quilts that have family trees on them, they have uh, photograph books on them, all these things. Have you ever done any of these? Oh yes, um, I've done several. Um, I have one that is, I've done uh, several t-shirt quilts, for instance. So you might, uh, my daughter and son-in-law were in uh, sorority fraternities, and so I used their t-shirts and made quilts. That's very popular. I've taken um, uh, somewhat of the photographs and old clothing from like my dad's old Hawaiian shirts, and I cut those up and put them back together in a quilt. Um, uh, the um, photograph, uh, you can actually copy fabrics as well as photos. So if I had, for instance, a, a quilt and I said I need a little bit more of this particular uh, purple print, I can uh, use special paper on the computer and reproduce that and add it maybe to a project that I'm working on. You can also um, do that. I, I encourage people who are making quilts to make labels, uh, identify who's making it, uh, if it's an old quilt, who made it in the past, how, what the history of it is, and you can print that on the computer and attach a label on the back of the quilt as well. Okay, uh, I'm going to stop you right here, so we're going to take a short break, and when we come back we're going to talk about the Singer sewing machine and the hand stitching. We'll be right back. <laughs> and we're discussing the history of quilts. Ellen, tell us about this quilting piece that you have here. Yes, this is um, something called Hawaiian quilting. Um, it really originated uh, at the time when um, Hawaii was being, I guess you could say, invaded by the Americans. And um, the missionaries, it said, brought their concepts of sewing. And the Hawaiians turned it into their own thing. And it's appliqued fabric. Uh, typically, it was two colors. Let's see if we could hold it up uh -huh. just a little bit. So there were closer. two colors. And so they would use um, flora and fauna that they were familiar with. This is a pineapple. And the way that they uh, did their quilting was they would quilt um, a finger's width 
apart all over the quilt. So it would be inside the pineapple and then outside the pineapple. Very And so it would follow like a ripple effect around the shape. Very, very interesting. The Hawaiians also, uh, at that time, because they weren't allowed to fly the Hawaiian flag, they would hide the flag on the back of a quilt. So the top of the quilt Do might look like a, this. Uh, oh. I don't have an example of that. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, uh, but on the back or either stuffed inside the quilt was their Hawaiian flag. And when the Hawaiians were meeting in their homes together, they would flip the quilt over and be able to appreciate their own flag. That's very interesting. And how about this other piece that you have here that's so nice? Yes, this is the um, t-shirt quilt I was talking about. This um, t-shirt fabric is different than cotton, so it's it's stretchable. Let's and see if we could hold that one yeah. up. Let me it's, see how we can stretch it. It's very that stretchy, out. and so it's it's a little more of a challenge to put the pieces together. Um, let me see. It's this way, backwards. Yeah. And well, either way. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do this. <laughs> But this is very popular as a keepsake. I've also done a quilt with um, my niece's rodeo shirts. I this cut them is up. beautiful. And um, also done wedding quilts. I have the family and members sign pieces of muslin fabric at the wedding instead of an autograph book and then take those pieces and put them into a quilt. Let's look at the other side of this. Let's see how can we turn this just like right that. This is really, really wonderful. And these are all pieces of t-shirts. Yes, uh -huh. all my um, daughter's t-shirts. And her uh, sorority group was uh, called the Monkeys, and so I threw a few little monkeys in there. That's so cute. And I bet she keeps this on her bed. Um, they use it as a lap quilt all the time watching TV. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice of you to bring it in. OK. And tell us about the little sewing machine here that oh, we're so crazy yes. about. This is called a featherweight. This is by Singer. It was a very popular, it was electric. Um, at first, of course, the Singer sewing machine was the old treadle machine. It's heavy, it's made out of iron, it weighs a lot, difficult to move around. did have roller coasters on it, but um, certainly not portable. So when this came out, this version that was electronic, of course, um, it was very popular. It's portable. The piece, of, yeah, it pops right it up and fits up. into a, its own special little um, carrying case. Um, you can take it to projects. I'm sure women in the um, 30s and 40s took it with them. Uh, if they were doing uh, group projects, they could take it to their neighbor's house and work on it. Um, so it was a lot of fun. There are many groups that follow the featherweight uh, community now. Um, you can find them on online in antique stores. Um, uh, condition is always a concern. You want to get one that's not too bad um, so that it can be cleaned up, it can be oiled and lubricated. So when you purchased this one, it was used? Yes. Oh, yes. They're all, uh, you can identify the age. They go back to the um, 30s. Um, there's a serial number on each machine, and okay. if you go to the website of Singer Company, you can find out where and when it was made. It could have been made in Scotland, it could have been made in New Jersey, um, there were many manufacturing centers. Do you centers. know where yours in particular is made? Yes, mine was New Jersey, and it's from 1952. It's yeah. in mint condition. It is, it's wonderful. As long as you keep it, um, take care of it, it will continue to work for you. Um, you can buy replacement parts, um, not a problem. There are people that meet and just, it's like a club, you know, let's bring our featherweights. Some were white um, that were from, um, I believe, Germany. Um, so there, there are many different types, but they're all the lightweight, easy to carry and use. So where do you take us from here? where are contests, conventions, and things like that that are taking place for quilters? Yes. Um, well, in San Antonio, for instance, uh, we have more than one quilt guild, and many cities will have that. So we have two that are what would you call more traditional quilters, um, but we're modern and artistic as well. There is a, a guild that has started around the country called the Modern Quilt Guild, which tends to go a little bit more modern than the more traditional styles. Um, you can find them online. You can find them um, at conventions. 
uh, Houston International Quilt Show in Houston every year in November, first part of November, has um, over 40,000 visitors. They have 2,400 or more vendors with quilt-related items. And this show is not the only one in the United States. There are other cities um, that have them as well, and other countries. How much of the population, could you give me a number, an estimate of how many quilters you think are in the United States, or internationally? Two and a half million is the next. At estimate. present? Yes, yes. And it's billions of dollars of <laughs> business, from fabric to patterns to tools. Um, to embellishments, we call them. People will add things to their quilts. It could be beads, um, it could be rickrack, it could be you know, most anything you can think of can be made. I've made a quilt out of paint chips from the hardware store that I actually sewed and had layered. Paint chips? Paint chips. I've okay, made... Okay, <laughs> what, what type of paint chips? That's very interesting. Um, just the kind, like if you're looking for samples of paint color for your wall. Okay. Um, I've made quilts out of um, uh, juice packets, L little kids, um, you find it in the grocery store, little um, kind of alu aluminum type juice mm -hmm. containers. I've made them out of um, packages that are... Um, How would you make something out of juice packets like that? You get a special foot for your sewing machine called a Teflon foot and it lets you um, sew over something that doesn't slide as easily as fabric through your sewing machine. But wouldn't that be tough if you would have to wash it or? Oh yes, it would be more of, um, it would be, uh, you could make bags out of it, like tote bags, you could make, um, you could do pillows, but they wouldn't be that comfortable, of course. You can do things for pets, you can do uh, floor coverings, you can do wall art. Very, very interesting. Yeah. And how about clothes, per se, quilted clothes? Yes, there are quite a few people that um, make uh, quilted clothing. Um, I would say when that uh, revival of quilting came in, kind of in the 70s and, and the 80s, people were making, if you can remember, prairie skirts um, back in the 70s. Uh, uh, so people were putting pieces of fabric together and then making lots of skirts. Because I recall recently I saw a couple of jackets and they were all quilted and they looked like they had been hand patched together. Yes, so we've kind of gone from the prairie skirt to elaborate costumes and outfits and hats uh, and bags and um, there's always, usually I would say, at a competition of a quilt show there is um, a wearable art category. So people are making these fabulous um, jackets um, dresses. I've People seen how fancy they can get. Wedding, a quilted wedding dress. Um, they're just all, there's no a limit really. A quilted wedding dress? Yes. No limit to what can be done. Yeah. Well, what can I tell you? Every day that there's a new thing that's coming out and also where is, is this going to take you from here? Do you plan to expand on what you're doing? Currently, or well, I I like to combine um, my interest in quilt history with quilts, and so uh, quilts just kind of come to me somehow, and um, I end up doing some refurbishing, um, some repairs. So I enjoy doing that. Um, so you've I, turned it into a business. I'm not yet, but it could be. <laughs> but uh, I I. I really want to restore some of the old things that can be. Now some old quilts cannot be restored, they're too far gone. And I really tell people, enjoy them. Where anyway. do you find old quilts? Um, online, antique stores, um, friends just seem to give me quilts that they no longer want and have no use for. Um, right now I'm doing a quilt history. Um, I happened to receive a quilt that um, had uh, signatures on it. This was a popular thing to do not only during the wars to raise funds but just as a friendship quilt they would sign them and I used um, online searching and ancestry uh, type uh, records to discover where they were from uh, because they were unusual names and I found them in a small city in Arkansas in the 1930s and I've reconnected with those people who are the descendants and I'm hoping to refurbish the quilt and take it to them uh, when they have an annual reunion. 
So you left one career and now you're into your second career. Yes. Is that what we're doing? <laughs> right. Well, it's been a pleasure having you on the program, and I want to thank you so, so much. Oh, well, and thank you. Because I know it was a last-minute thing, but I had... I made tons of calls trying to reach you, and I was so excited when I did. And I hope that you folks at home have learned a lot from this, and we'd like to thank you, uh, Ellen Hernandez, for being here. And we'll see you on the next program. Thank you for watching. <laughs>